It is my pleasure to welcome Scott Malburn. Scott, are you with us? I am here. Thanks, Mark. Great to have you here. So Scott's an artist and curator. And since 2015, he has served as director of the Schneider Museum of Art in Ashland, Oregon, which is part of the Oregon Center for the Arts at Southern Oregon University. Scott's paintings have been exhibited widely at, uh, for example, Dischecta Contemporary Art Center in Portland, Oregon, the Noise Museum in New Jersey, White Walls Gallery in San Francisco, Kunsthalle Beacon, just up the Hudson River in Beacon, New York, David Richard Gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Rogue Art Space in New York, Kunsthalle Galapagos in Brooklyn, Denise Bibro Fine Art uh, in New York, uh, Platform New York, uh, which is a, a cool event in which David Zwarner invited a whole bunch of other galleries um, to show. Uh, Envoy Enterprises in New York, Central Utah Art Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, New Bedford Museum of Art in Massachusetts, and the H. Lewis Gallery in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, his upcoming exhibition, which is titled Shh, We're Hunting Tigers, will open at Truck and Broad Gallery in Corvallis, Oregon on October 3rd. So that's gonna be new paintings, I believe. Um, his work has been reviewed in the Brooklyn Rail, in Dart International Magazine, New York Arts Magazine, WAGMAG, artcritical.com, and the Standard Times. On the curatorial side, Scott has organized exhibitions at Platform New York, Hunter College here in New York City, Janet Kernatowski Gallery in Brooklyn, Landing Space also in Brooklyn, and H. Lewis Gallery in Baltimore, and of course also at the Schneider Museum of Art in Ashland, uh, where he is director. Scott uh, has served on the faculties of Pratt Institute and Southern Oregon University, got a BFA from MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art in 2001, and an MFA from Pratt in 2004. Uh, so um, here's the format tonight. Um, we're gonna begin ha uh, having a conversation, kind of walking through Scott's uh, pre-professional development. Um, then Scott's gonna take over and do a, a conventional slide talk about his own work. And then we'll go back into conversation mode and talk about, um, you know, uh, basically, you know, uh, how you know his professional path from graduate school uh, as a young emerging artist in New York through now running a museum on the West Coast. So, um, Scott, um, do you have a like an origin story uh, for yourself as an artist? Were you you know one of these people that you know uh, was was born with a paintbrush in their hand, or was there some point at which you realize, hey, you know, this is, this is what I want to do with my life, or this is who I am? Uh, good question, Mark. Um, yes, I was definitely, um, came out of my mother's womb holding a paintbrush. Uh, I was stretching and priming canvas. Um, yes, my entire life, like many of you um, here today, my entire life, as far back as I can remember, for some reason or other, I've always gravitated uh, towards art and art making. Um, it's a little bit in the family. Um, I was the first to go to college for it. My father was offered scholarships to go to college for art. He turned that down and married his high school sweetheart and uh, you know, started a family and was, uh, became a mechanic. But um, yeah, my entire life I was always um, into art and gravitated towards art. And I knew that's the path that I wanted to be on. So your dad was a mechanic. He worked with his hands. Did he that? Did. Yeah, jack of all trades. Um, he, he just retired. He was working most recently for Electric Boat, which uh, builds nuclear submarines. And he was sort of a jack of the all, all trades assembly. But as a child, uh, elementary school, when we would put um, covers over your school books, we'd use uh, brown paper. And I would always ask him to you know, write the title of the book or draw images uh, for me. Um, he built much around our house and he would always draw out the plans himself. Um, so I was very fortunate that when I decided to go to school for art, I had that support system. The family really supported my decision. And my father would say, I am, I'm living vicariously through you. 
in making that choice. That's so cool. So the the stereotype of the you know the parents who you know pressure their kids to become doctors or or engineers didn't apply to you. No, it didn't. I mean, they supported me so much that at one point I thought I would make a career change. I was I was involved in the skateboarding world uh, in California at one point. So I went to a university in Connecticut and was going to major in business marketing um, and get involved in that business. And then I opted to maybe try to uh, transfer to the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, in which they offered me some scholarships. Then the school I was at offered me a full, a full ride to stay. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it. And my mother even kind of said to me, are you crazy? Like, you need to go to school for art. You know, we really support that decision. So uh, I did transfer to the Maryland, Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. I just have to ask, so you were a skater kid out in California somehow? Like after high school, you went out there to skate? Yes, after high school, I went out to California to skate as some of my friends uh, are professional skateboarders. Uh, and some of them, even at this age now, you know, I'm in my early 40s, uh, still do it. One of them is Brian Anderson, um, who recently, um, you know, came out of the closet known as one of the first major professional skateboarders to uh, come out of the closet. Wow. Um, so were you in, uh, in LA, uh, like Venice, like skating? Um, we were, I was going to move to San Diego and uh -huh. then ended up last minute moving to Sacramento as one of my friends, his company's uh, videographer uh -huh. lived in Sacramento, um, also known as Sacto. Uh, right. So we went to, I went to Sacramento for one year to take a break after high school, before college. Um, it was great. I highly you know, recommend high school students, you know, to take, take a break because it really um, gave me, you know, um, the confidence to figure out who I am and what I want to do and what kind of career path I wanted to uh, try to follow. Nowadays, when, when kids take gap years, it seems like it's, you know, mostly, you know, resume padding so they can get into like a better college. Um, I really admire that you just went, went to skate. I did something similar. I went, I went out west to ski for a year. Um, well, so, okay, so, so one more thing to add, Mark, it's yeah. funny because I took a Greyhound bus across country. I had a small bag of clothes and a huge duffel bag of art supplies. <laughs> That's awesome. So not just skate, not just skating, but also making art. That's cool. Um, so, all right, so you arrive at MICA and um you know this is i guess the um the late 90s you're probably there like 90 you're probably arriving like 96 or so and what was it like for you you know being in art school in the in the late 90s and how do you think it's you know maybe different from from today um Arriving in art school was an incredible. Um, you know, I was at a state university for a short period of time and arriving at the art school, I really felt as though, you know, um, I found my tribe, you know. Um, I found people who were as interested in art and art making as I was and to have a school that puts that in the forefront. You know, academics are important, but equally important is you know, what you are doing in the studio and the studio classes and making the work. So I really felt as though I made the right decision. And uh, did you know from the start that you were headed towards painting or was there a process of finding your way toward that? Uh, painting was always my go-to uh, at MICA in Baltimore. Uh, I tried everything else, video art, installation art, uh, everything in which I've always came back to painting because all of the ideas and the concepts that I was working with and this other, other media, um, I was able to do uh, within a painting. Um, so I really just kept, I would try other things and just kept coming back to painting. So um, rolling forward to Finishing up at MICA, I'm guessing that you took a year between MICA and Pratt? 
Now, I took a little bit of time, uh, just a few months, uh, being a transfer student at MICA, I graduated in oh. the winter in, in December. So I took the spring off and then went right into graduate school at Pratt. Um, and I'm feeling as knowing that I took that year off between high school and college, and then uh, state university transferring to the art school, um, I really knew what I wanted to do. And graduating and leaving Baltimore, I wanted to go up to New York City. I wanted to be in that area uh, with the art world and the art market in the backyard. Um, I, it's a little bit of a, of a personal question, but I'm just wondering <laughs> if, um, you know, having spent, I guess, a couple of years at, at MICA and then, you know, deciding to, to sort of double down on art school and go ahead and get an MFA, um, you know, that that's, can be pretty expensive uh, even then. And did you, did that give you pause? Did the, you know, the, the cost of, of graduate school and, you know, potentially the, the debt burden uh, was that something that you that you weren't sure was the right call for you? I knew it was the right call. Um, I was the first in my family to go on to receive a master's degree. Taking time off between high school and college, as well as having a a season or two seasons, a spring and a summer between undergrad and grad school, and living and working and paying rent and paying bills, I knew I wanted to. Um, do whatever I could to follow a path, so to speak, to set myself up as best as possible for successes that I was looking for um, and making work and, and showing work. And I knew that, you know, with my time at MICA, there was more to learn, more to do. I knew that in graduate programs, uh, we are more introduced to, to theory. Um, you are then put in with a cohort who are also making that leap and taking that chance. Um, so ha knowing that there's gonna be a cohort of other students, we're all gonna be in the same boat and we can help each other and we can collaborate and work together um, that we can find a way of sorts. Was, did you feel like um, going from being a, you know, a senior at MICA um, to you know, being in your first year at Pratt, was it, a big sort of leveling up um, was a big step up in terms of, I don't know, the, the seriousness of your peers or the level of discourse or the amount of work people were putting in. Uh, honestly, honestly, Mark, it, it was a little bit the opposite um, coming from MICA and then going to a graduate program in which a graduate program is going to have a diverse group coming from different academic undergraduate programs. At MICA in Baltimore, you know, uh, the criticism, you know, the painting classes, uh, the students, the friendly competition uh, was so intense. Uh, and then going to Pratt and finding myself in a class with students from uh, state universities or other places that may not have had the rigorous critique process that, you know, mm. classes taught by certain individuals like Jeremy Sigler that would take, you know, six hours of critiquing, you develop a bit of a, a stamina to sit in that room and critiquing fellow students' arts for hours and hours and hours. Then going to graduate school and being in a group that uh, may not have experienced that or that stamina or may not have read the same um, texts. Um, so my first semester um, was a tough one. Um, I was doubting myself, did I make the right decision? Um, should I have gone to a, a different program? And at the end of that semester, I told myself, I need to take my education into my own hands. I need to pinpoint the fellow students who, who are serious. We need to develop a bit of a group and talk about what we want to do. And there was an existing student organization called the Pratt Artist League. And we uh, revamped that and took that over in which it had just improved the program and improved my educational experience. 
I, I gained valuable experience by putting in that work. The faculty and the staff recognized what we as students were doing, and they gave us accolades for those, for those efforts. Um, and then during my second year, we quickly turned to the first year incoming students and welcomed them, informed them, you know, these were our first year experiences. We want you to know that you are welcomed here. You are part of this group now, and we want to help you make the best of your two years here. So we created a pretty tight knit group. That's fantastic. So glad to hear that. Um, in terms of your work, did you like arrive at Pratt then kind of fully formed as a painter? And was it a process of learning how to talk about the work better and learning uh, and just, you know, sort of refining it? Or did your work evolve and change a lot during those couple of years uh, in Brooklyn? It, it evolved and changed a bit. Uh, being at MICA, the work evolved and changed immensely, almost making the opposite of what I was doing when I entered MICA. And then at Pratt, there was a process in my painting. I was getting into hard edge geometrical painting. But there was a process in which I would create these atmospheric organic backgrounds. And then at times putting them within these geometrical shapes. And during a critique, somebody mentioned that it looked like faux finishing. It was getting really tight, looked like faux finishing. <laughs> so I opted to take out the biomorphic organic atmospheric qualities and go uh, totally flat, completely flat. So more uh, flat fields, with the hard edge geometrical painting. And it was a, it made my head spin because uh, as I said, going into MICA, I was making a completely different kind of work. Uh, when I was living in New Haven, Connecticut, I was actually selling my paintings. I thought I arrived at what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And that going to MICA, I was gonna continue to make this work and then later graduate school. Uh, but the faculty have an effect. Your fellow students have an effect and having an open mind um, and listening and taking notes and you know every if there's 10 comments and a critique maybe two or three of those comments really strike a chord within you and stick with you and go you go back into the studio and this is the time to take those chances and take a risk uh, when you are working in this think tank atmosphere with your fellow students to try new things so i would go into the creative mode create a lot of work, very open, very obtuse, and then through critiques, uh, edit down the process, um, kind of eliminating all of the unnecessary stuff so that the necessary uh, can speak. And that's a Hans Hoffman quote, and that's something that's always stuck with me. Mm. So Hans Hoffman um, was, for, for you know students who haven't heard that name, uh, a really influential New York painter who was a little bit older, I believe, than a lot of the abstract expressionists who became super well known, like um, uh, uh, wow, how can I be blanking on um, the name of the of the Dutch painter who painted Mother? Um, anyway, he had was really influential on a lot of the abstract expressionists. One of his um, one of the phrases that he often used was push and pull. But um, really uh, interesting abstract painter who is, I think, in some ways best known for the, the students that he, or the artists who he influenced and the artists who he taught. Um, so Scott, I think what I'd like to do now is hand it over to you to actually show us some of your work. Um, and then we can resume our conversation after everyone's had a chance to, to see it and to hear you talk about it. All right, great, thanks Mark. Um, um, so, Mark, thank you so much for this invitation, invitation to uh, meet you all and speak to your students. Uh, I'm going to share just about a dozen plus images with you guys. And as we discuss my evolu evolution into becoming a uh, curator, um, museum director, it is important to know that I consider myself an artist uh, still. Uh, and this is something I did, as I mentioned, my entire life and the reason why I went to art school. Uh, so the short of it is my work is hard edge geometrical work with a minimalist bent. This is a painting titled Shh, We're Hunting Tigers. It's 24 by 18 acrylic on canvas stretched over panel. As Mark mentioned, 
have an exhibition coming up in Corvallis uh, this weekend. The exhibition is titled After This Painting. Um, as a painter, I make my own paints. I use liquid dispersions and powdered pigments. I buy these from a store in New York City called Guerra Paint and Pigment. It's on 13th Street between Avenue A and B, uh, except for the hazardous stuff. Um, I will buy the cadmiums and cobalts pre-made from Golden. And I make my own paints because I wanted to control the viscosity of my paint as well as ensure good quality. Uh, this piece is a new piece, um, untitled, 16 by 20 inches, acrylic on canvas over panel. I like to work on canvas or linen stretched over panel because when you work hard edge, that stiff resistance allows you to sand down the many layers of gesso that I use for a very smooth surface. It allows me to burnish down the tape for a good seal. And I work in thin washes and brush out my brush strokes. And I sand between each layer. The panel helps with this. This is an older painting from 2012 titled Gift, acrylic, silica, and urethane on canvas stretched over panel. Um, here's an example of an underpaintings and a kind of relief painting. Uh, using tape and building up the layers, you can create a relief to the painting, much like embossment and printmaking. It adds another layer to the work. The red you see is one color red. The other colors are the strong underpainting colors coming through the transparent red. This painting is titled Cake. It's 20 by 16 acrylic, silica, and urethane on canvas. I like shaped canvases, although I haven't made many. Here I am play playing with the weave of the canvas. The, uh, if you can see it here, it's almost like a black denim. The black is sanded down with black gesso and acrylic paint so that the material of the canvas comes through, making a bit of a texture. It's a nod toward the materials that the painting is on, as well as a play with the depth of the many layers of the other, other colors. Here are two images of the same piece. There is a border of white gesso and acrylic paint sanded down so that the weave of the canvas comes through. So you can see that better on this image. So it's a, it's a darker image. The yellow is thick and appears to rest on the surface. And when you come up close, you can kind of see um, the dimensionality of it all. Okay, this can, see, can see, uh, be seen best in the one on the left. The one on the right is how it may look in a lit gallery. It kind of flattens out a little bit until you get up close to the painting. Uh, and this painting is titled Two Sheets, 16 by 20 inches, acrylic on canvas over panel. Influences, art historically, the work is rooted in post painterly abstraction and high modernist art such as minimalism. The work is hard edged and geometrical. Artists such as Ellsworth Kelly, Frank Stella, Kenneth Nolan, Solowit, come from this time and have inspired me for many years. Some of them shared a particular motif, which is the chevron. At one point in my studio, I couldn't get this chevron out of my head. I was living in Queens, New York, driving into Brooklyn every day for work. There were road signs, fire trucks, ambulances, everything had the chevron on it. I had just done a trip um, to Mass Mocha and saw the Solowit exhibition there. Um, so, and, and it was also the year that Kenneth Nolan passed away. So these chevrons were, were sticking with me. I decided to make this 72 inch square painting, two panels, to kind of get the chevron out of my system, but it didn't work and I made many more. 
um, I made big ones and small ones. And, but the series from working with these chevrons, the series that I liked the most is one, one that, that I titled Modular Chevron Series. Here we have a 24 inch by 36 inch panel with a chevron turned on its side that can be paired with another panel. And then these can be added and stacked, create a kind of a grid. This is how I'd show them most of the time, a 24 inch by 72 inch two panel piece. And another example of pairing them together. Or I would show them individually. Some are bright colors, others are subtle pastels, such as these ones here. I would pair the pastels with the bright colors for a different feel and look. Another example. So these had a strong underpainting to them as well. Uh, the bright colors you are, are seeing, the yellow and the orange, those are the final colors. That's one color laying on top of other colors. And I would put down these thin layers and make the decision <clears throat> of how far or how many layers I wanted to do, how much I wanted to bury the underpainting. And it really created this beautiful luminosity to the work. A couple more of those. Uh, today, the way that I talk about these paintings are in response to what is happening in the world. I hope that these paintings make themselves available as a way to drop out and take in information, but not consume it. For culture today is connected more than ever, but not in personal or always personable ways. Our nature to connect has been co-opted by industry. Eyes and, my stay, eyes and minds stay plugged in and become consumed and we reciprocate by consuming. I participate as I spend too much time online as well. This work is a practice in awareness, self-care, escaping, relaxing by relaxing time, noticing and creating time well spent. For me, this practice is a way to endure, to turn to something that is sustaining, it is a thoughtful activity and allows me to tap into my subconscious, my inventiveness and imagination. It's a search for the mysterious and sublime. So that's all the work I wanted to share. I didn't want to spend too much time talking about my work as I think talking about the transition from grad school into working professionally in the becoming a museum director would be very valuable to you all. Thanks, Scott. Really appreciate it. It was, it was always so helpful to hear people talk about their own work um, rather than just looking at it and reading about it. Um, so, okay, so picking up the thread of the story, um, when you finish up at Pratt, you had been, sounds like you've been really proactive in terms of uh, taking initiative to make sure the program was was meeting your needs um what was it like then for you you know you now you you're a master of fine arts you're in new york city and uh you know what was it like to be you know at this point an emerging artist finish the school and trying to figure out how to make your way in the world um you know this is pre-covid <laughs> so uh quite quite the hustle. You know, I knew that I wanted to do whatever it took to stay in New York City. So as even before I was graduating from Pratt, um, I knew that at graduation time, New York City is going to get thousands of undergrads and grads looking for those day jobs. So I started applying for jobs on the early end to try to get ahead of the curve. And I took a position at the Isama Noguchi Museum in Long Island City, New York, as a guard, as working the front desk. And the museum had just gone through a renovation and reopened its original location. 
and it was beautiful. And I was able to witness these administrators coming into work, working in beautiful offices. Uh, there was a, a shared kitchen, um, continuing the conversation of the visual, visual arts. I knew that um, you know, this, this could be a possibility. And shortly thereafter, I was asked to take on a full-time uh, position uh, there, just going a few months into it. Um, I was also working for an artist named Erwin Rettel. Oh, yeah. A, a light oh, artist. Man. Yeah. So Erwin is an artist who had a studio in New York City. Now he's in Ohio. Uh, but with his studio, he would receive commissions around the world and would hire about a dozen of uh, us younger artists uh, to make his work. But he paid us exceptionally well. Um, even back then, you know, getting paid like $20 an hour was, was great. Um, and we would work five, six days a week. But I took the Noguchi Museum job knowing that that might be a longer run. And I was doing both for a while until I was offered the full-time position at the Noguchi Museum. Still work in the desk? Or was that, did you have different responsibilities when you went full-time? Different responsibilities. Um, they kind of created like a new office uh, in the back, kind of dealing with people coming and going, scheduling things, mailing things. Uh, but that also only lasted a number of months as the curatorial assistant was moving on to uh, another gallery. I put in my, uh, my application, my resume uh, for that position. And only because doing the independent curatorial work um, from an undergrad and grad student. When I was an undergrad in, in Baltimore, a number of students and I ran an art space called the H. Lewis Gallery. I was wondering if you were involved in founding that. I found, you know, I Googled it and I found that it was started by a bunch of MICA undergrads. And that it was you. Was. And it was an incredible space. Uh, we showed, you know, not very well known at the time, but Uber person now, you know, we showed Shepard Ferry and we were like one of its first East Coast gallery representations. And, and Steph so, and I took a silk screen class together at RISD. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I met Shepard uh, through my skateboarding days when I lived in Connecticut, going up to Providence uh, for skateboarding as right. a young kid. So um, we, got a little, we got a little anecdote about Shep Ferry. So um, we were in this photo silk screen class and uh, what he was doing was making, um, in Providence, Rhode Island, the parking tickets were bright orange. He was basically making fake parking tickets and he made them by the thousands and just left them on people's windshields all over the city. So you you know see that bright orange parking ticket, you know, your jaw would drop, your heart would sink, and then you go pick it up and you realize it was a little piece of prank art. So he, <laughs> Jeff Barry then ended up, he was the guy who like, you know, developed the Andre the Giant brand and um, you see his work all over the world now. Yeah. And now he's in advertising. Is he? Yeah. No, he is. Uh, he, but he, in, uh, interestingly, he first got into it to do ads. One of his first ads was the Sprite commercial, Obey Your Thirst. Mm. And then he himself would climb up to the billboards and black out everything except for the Obey which related to the Andre the, the Giant series. Oh, right. right. But um, yeah, you know, moving on uh, at the uh, Noguchi Museum, uh, I did get the curatorial assistant position. Um, so this is all within the first year after graduating uh, from Pratt. And, and I think it really comes from, you know, doing the work. Um, trying to get ahead of the curve, researching, applying, uh, you know, trying to do well in the interviews. And all of the experiences that I took on previously that I said yes to, experiences that many of us want to say no to, such as joining the H. Lewis Gallery Collective in which you have to gallery sit and pay dues as an undergrad. As an undergrad, I didn't want to pay money to be part of something. I wanted to spend that money on art materials. But I did it so that I could host my own exhibitions in that space. And I learned a lot running that space as an undergrad. And then in New York City, the curatorial mission kind of followed. And people who knew myself or the H. Lewis Gallery from Baltimore 
who were working at galleries in New York City would ask me if I would curate exhibitions for their spaces. And this would go unpaid. And I knew that it's a lot of work. Working with artists is very hard. Artists are not the great people, greatest people to work with. What? So I beg to differ. Well, this is this is, you know, I'm, I'm younger here. So, you know, art emailing student, art students, you know, emailing artists. Can I get your artist statement? Can I have your resume? Do you have any images? And they would write back, I don't believe in artist statements. And then it's like, oh boy, this is gonna be difficult. Um, it's often a, thank, a thankless job, but we did it to get friends artwork out of the studios and into galleries. But that experience carried into the Noguchi position in which the curator said, okay, you understand what's going on, you know, the kind of work that needs to be done, and we'll give you a shot. And so I was at the Noguchi Museum for a number of years. How did you land that job at the Noguchi <laughs> Museum? I mean, like, did, was it just, did you know somebody or did you just, you well, know, how did you find I out was, about it? I was already there, you know, so I had my foot in the door. So I took the entry level position as a guard, working the desk, they recognized we could use him to do more things. Created a position, I took that. When the curatorial assistant left, I applied. The curator and I, we got along. Um, so it worked out. You know, it just kind of worked out for me. And how about um, your first professional shows in New York? How did those come about? Um, meeting people, connecting, trading studio visits. Um, you know, so. We're going pre-COVID, so now you're gonna have to want to do that on Zoom. Um, but you know, meeting other artists, you know, going up to them, telling them that you like and appreciate their work, um, that you would love to do a studio visit with them sometime. You know, we call it trading studio visits. When you have people come to your studio, you try to be very gracious. You try to offer some food, some coffee, um, talk, and you kind of create this uh, connection. Um, and then these people, you know, your cohort of students here, um, people are going to go off and get jobs. So you might be, you know, working one job and your friend's working at, at a gallery and they have a relationship with their gallerist. And in New York City, in the summertime, especially in August, many galleries close. Some take that as an opportunity to put up large group shows, kind of like a Let's take a chance and do something new. Um, and a lot of people would be discovered uh, during those types of exhibitions. So it's a social activity. You, know, you cannot be in your studio 24 seven, waiting for a curator to knock on your door. Um, you know, today we have social media and other forms of communication to get out there and meet and connect. Um, so that is an important part of the artist practice. Um, I'm curious where your career took you um, after the Noguchi. Like, I imagine that you went through a series of jobs before uh, the opportunity to, to head out to Oregon arose. Uh, yes, Mark. Um, as I mentioned, when I was a graduate student at Pratt, taking the initiative to start new things and work with my students and create opportunities for ourselves and the faculty and staff took notice, the chair of the graduate program and undergraduate program uh, at Pratt, one of the faculty were going, was going away on sabbatical and they needed somebody to teach a few classes. And she reached out and asked if I would be interested. Teaching a few classes uh, wasn't going to cover my bills, so to speak. So I asked about taking only two of the courses and keep my full-time job at the Noguchi Museum. So I taught Thursday nights and Friday mornings uh, for a few years. Um, and then the um, assistant chairperson, uh, Sheila Pepe, moved up to the Dean's office as a special assistant to the Dean and the chair asked if I would step in as the assistant chairperson at Pratt Institute. So I left the Noguchi Museum full time and found myself 
sort of running the undergraduate program at Pratt Institute as the assistant chairperson. Wow. Yeah, she lives on our faculty now, actually. Yeah. Uh, she's pretty great. Um, that sounds fortunate. And at this point, did you have a studio somewhere in New York? Where were you, where were you making your paintings? I had a studio in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Um, I lived in Brooklyn and moved around a little bit and, and ended up uh, in Long Island City, Queens, near the Noguchi Museum. So working at Pratt, I would leave early in the morning, go to the studio in the morning for a couple of hours, get a little bit of work done, a little bit of prep work, go to Pratt, work on my way home, stop at the studio, work a few more hours. And then with Pratt, I, I had Fridays off. It was a four day uh, work week. So on the weekends, I would clock in these uh, 12 hour days on Fridays and Saturdays, and then maybe just a few hours on Sundays. So I did see it as, you know, working two full-time jobs. As an undergrad, um, I remember one of the faculty talking about, it's great if you can take a part-time job, you know, in New York City, bartend, then you can paint all day, you know, make your art, do something. If you take a full-time job, it's going to be very hard to continue full-time studio practice hours. I kind of like clock in and clock out. So I took the full-time position telling myself, I'm only going to do this if I can continue to work 30 to 40 hours a week in the studio. And that really did make all of the difference because no week would go by without getting work done. You know, each week turns into a month and then a season. So by getting work done, even though I was working a full-time job, I was able to produce the work. So when a student, when a studio opportunity, studio visit opportunity comes up, I had work and process, a body of work completed, as opposed to just talking about what I want to do. It sounds, um, honestly, sound, I mean, it sounds familiar. Um, yeah. What my life, you know, has, has been like for a long time, um, kind of burning the candle at both ends, but, um, but also hard. I mean, did it ever, I mean, it sounds like sometimes exciting, but did it ever feel kind of bleak or like hopeless or like a grind and like barely making ends meet? I imagine paying off student loans and paying studio rent and paying your rent at home. And, you know, it's hard to afford to, you know, join your friends for dinner when, you know, maybe they have more spending money than you do. I'm just imagining what it was like. Um, yeah. yeah, you are uh, painting the perfect picture. Uh, it was a sacrifice, and I think mo many artists make many sacrifices um, for their work, for their career, for their life, for what they want to set up. Um, so I did. I made many sacrifices financially. You know, it was a struggle. It was a grind. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, I was happy. I was satisfied. I could sit in the studio and make this work as I kind of read what this work is about today, you know, the work uh, is very meaningful uh, to myself. You know, finding, working with my hands, finding the time to escape the internet, the news channels, everything that's going on. Um, it really helped me kind of relax and find a bit of a center. Um, there was times when I was working at the Noguchi Museum after graduate school where it did feel kind of depressing, kind of hard. I stopped going to opening receptions as much. Um, you know, num a number of months went by and then I kind of realized that I needed to get back in there and show up and show my face and communicate. Um, and when I, when I did that, it was an epiphany again. It was, uh, you know, these are my people, this is my tribe, we can talk about Art, we can talk about the past, present, we can talk about the future and how we contribute to society, how we create community, and we are important to, to you know, who we are and where, where we are living. Um, and then I started, you know, every week, especially living in New York City, every week there was multiple events going on. Um, so I had to shift into, you know, how can one sustain that 
you know, and I really started um, being very systemized about like exercise, eating well, you know, not drinking too much coffee during the day so I don't crash at five o'clock when you want to go to opening reception somewhere. Our, you know, you begin to adapt. Humans are the most adaptable uh, creatures. So um, really kind of making these personal life choices and decisions on how I could work two jobs, uh, you know, working at Pratt, working in the studio, as well as uh, being social. So it was, I guess, a good 10 years between when you graduated Pratt and when you moved to Oregon. Um, are there any other moments in that trajectory? You know, let's, let's sort of shift forward to, towards the, the sort of the, the second half or the, the latter couple of years of that decade. Um, the art world is changing. You're, you know, you're no longer just out of school. You've been doing this for a while. I've been holding down these various jobs, sort of balancing, you know, these different roles, academic, studio, going out and being, you know, showing up for your friends and, you know, at their openings and stuff like that and showing your work. Um, you know, do you start to then think about what's next? I mean, how do you, how do you get to the, you know, walk me towards, you know, towards Ashland. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I would probably still be living and working in New York City if my father-in-law did not pass away. So my wife is from Southern Oregon and her father passed away suddenly in a car accident. And this is right when I started the position as the assistant chairperson at Pratt Institute. And her parents were older. Her mom had just turned 70 at the time. And her parents were back to the landers, or beaten at hippies. So we knew that her mom was going to be alone on this large property, huge garden, small orchard, um, a barn, garden house, um, lots to take care of. And so it was a two-year conversation with her mother about what she wanted to do next. And she did not want to move to New York City. Uh, family invited her uh, to move closer to them. She didn't want to be a burden. So we opted that we had to go. We had to go to Oregon to fix up the property, turn it into a rental or let her, let her sell it. And then we ourselves get resituated for her, for her to live uh, near us. Um, and sadly, at this time in New York City, uh, my personal art really started to take off. I was being added to lists of, you know, next 30 artists to watch in New York City this year. Um, galleries were reaching out for exhibitions. I was already kind of committed to a small space in Brooklyn known as Janet Kronotowski and a space in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, David Richard Gallery. So I was kind of actually turning some galleries down. Um, then when we opted to make the move, I began looking into resources here in Southern Oregon in which there is a university. And I sent some information on to the university, introducing myself, who I am and what I do. And if any opportunities came up, uh, let me know. And they were very gracious here and reached out and said, if you ever come, come say hello. Um, so we came but out. Who was your contact there? Like, who did you send that letter or email to? Was it a dean? Was it the head of the museum? Was it the head of the art center? The chair of the art program. I see. You know. yeah. Um, so you so basically think, sent a cold email, you introducing yourself. He well, didn't know you from a... You I, know. Did, I did the packet. I did the packet in the mail, hard copy information, letter, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that old school sort of thing. Isn't that and, interesting? I just want to point this out. This is something that um, Sharon Loudon, who's on our faculty, uh, you know, uh, editor of the Living and Sustaining a Creative Life book series, um, she, she talks a lot about the cold call or the cold email or the cold packet where you do your research and you send a really thoughtful introduction. And I don't know how many years later, but we're, you know, you, now you're the director of the museum. Exactly, Mark. That is so important for students to know, uh, thoughtful and professional, you know, 
So, you know, most of us are visual people. I, w- I was, I've been always a visual person my whole life, struggled with the writing, the written word. And that took a lot of practice for, for me. Um, but learning how to put together the professional letter, asking one or two friends to proofread things before you send them off. I still do that as the museum director. Uh, that is important because uh, whoever is receiving that, you never know what kind of opportunity, what sort of need they may have. They might not even want to do the work to put the, put the call out that they have a need. So to put things into fit people's fingertips, um, to send thoughtful emails. And when you create these relationships, if a relationship is created, to stay in touch uh, with these people. So as you meet curators, if you meet people working at galleries, even if they're not interested in you and your work right now, if you feel as though they are open for communications, always send them a note, what you're working on now, what you're, what you're about to do, what shows you have coming up, because you never know when you're gonna be at the right place at the right time. That's really, really good advice. Can you talk a little bit about your sense of what success means to you now, professional success? Um, and it sounds like you made a really tough decision to put your family first. Um, and now on the other side of that decision, you know, how do you feel about where you are uh, in your life professionally and balancing you know, artistic practice and your career as an artist with uh, you know, curating and, and running an institution? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I feel so fortunate um, to have these, these opportunities um, but they definitely came because of hard work put in, you know, so um, as we're talking about, you know, creating relationships, meeting your fellow students, connecting with others, staying, staying in touch, working hard in your studio and your, in your personal practice, um, being able to communicate to other artists about what they are, they are doing. Um, you know, that's how I got the teaching opportunity, which led into the assistant chair administrative opportunity. That experience, you know, um, allowed the university here to be open to meeting me and hear about what I can bring to the table in which I came in teaching just a couple of courses for them uh, term by term. Um, and then the museum director uh, was, was leaving the museum and the director of the Oregon Center for the Arts got his hands on my resume because the chairperson told him, you know, these are the type of adjuncts. These are the kind of artists we love to come here. These are the artists who are really um, making impact on our students and talking about the bigger picture and what they can do. And the director saw that I had worked at a museum, a collecting museum, the Noguchi Museum. I had taught, had done the administrative work and asked if I would come into the Schneider Museum of Art as an interim director, a one-year contract, so then so that they can do a search for the year. My wife and I were done helping my mother-in-law with her property. We were about to move to Los Angeles, California. Our bags were packed. We were a week away from going down to stay with friends and uh, attend some job interviews when I was asked that question to become the director of the Schneider Museum. And uh, I said, well, I need to know what that, what that looks like on paper and, and speak to my wife. And my wife said, you know, you made the sacrifice leaving Pratt to help my mom. If you want to stay here in Oregon and try this job out, as opposed to moving to LA, in which my wife loves Los Angeles, um, we can give it a shot for one year. Um, I quickly realized that with the museum and the gallery spaces here, we can do a lot of good work. And I applied for the position. Fortunately, I I was offered the full-time position and I've been here for five years now. And professionally speaking, um, I feel as though, you know, the museum work um, allows me to do good work, selfless work. 
I feel good about what I'm doing when I am promoting other artists who are doing good work, not just making good art, but have a vision and a mission. And then we can share that with the museum's audiences here in which we cater both to academic and, and community groups at the Schneider Museum of Art. And then personally for my art making practice, if I can get into the studio, which I do, and if I can continue to making this work that's meaningful for me, uh, I am finding a balance. It's not always perfect. It's not always beautiful. There are always ups and downs, um, but being an optimistic person that even through the hard times, in which we're at a hard time right now, uh, due to some recent fires here in Southern Oregon, our preparator's home uh, burned down mm. and he's opting to move to Dallas, Texas. And I'm in need of a new museum preparator. Um, even in these hard times, I know that we will get through this and there will be more incredible things to be done and happen in the museum with our exhibitions and our programs. What, one last question, and then I'll open it up to uh, our students um, to ask questions too and offer comments. What's, um, what's your favorite part about your job right now? What do you enjoy most? Um, you know, being an artist, as I say, going to, going to art school and feeling like this is my tribe, these are my people, to have this job is just incredible. I mean, if you're going to work a full-time job, if you can work in the arts and do something meaningful, it is so rewarding. And I know just how lucky and fortunate I am uh, to do that. And to communicate with artists, and I, I need to add that for the Schneider Museum, we, we have a collection, but from my experiences of living and working in New York City for, for 10 years, it was always the galleries we loved to go to. We loved to go to the galleries and see what's happening here and now and today. We go to the museums like once a month, but the galleries every week, a few times a week, going to the galleries. So with the Schneider Museum, what I wanted to do is do this hybrid model of, it's like, it's like a museum slash Chelsea gallery. Um, I will put permanent collection work up occasionally and mostly lit, work with living, breathing artists so that we could bring them here to give talks to our students, give critiques, and our students can see work that's being, being done today, made today, not just work from the, the uh, stacks and, and uh, rooms with everything put away. We'll take that work out uh, every once in a while and put together curated exhibitions or do like highlights of the permanent collection. But for the past years, I put a strong emphasis on working with contemporary art artists, living, breathing artists. All right. Well, thank you so much, Scott. Really appreciate your um, taking the time to share your work uh, and to, to entertain my questions. So now I'd like to invite um, questions from from our our audience, from from our students. You're welcome to and put your questions in the chat or to just uh, unmute and uh, ask away. And if you could just introduce yourself as you begin, that'd be great. Uh, nice to meet you, Scott. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I was just wondering about your um, skateboarding past. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if, do you still occasionally skate every now and then? Yes, I do. Um, moving to Oregon, it's funny, when I was in New York City, I kind of stopped skateboarding because the skateboards made so much noise on the streets. I felt like I was disrupting my neighbors and I spent a lot of time in the studio. But when I came to Oregon, my friends in California came up to visit, they brought their skateboards. I asked why, and they said it's because Oregon has so many outdoor concrete skateboard parks. And they started to show them to me. And um, yes, now I skateboard it. And I have a four-year-old four -year son in which uh, we're starting to teach him how to skateboard. And when I was younger, I used to say that 
when I'm too old for skateboarding, I'll start surfing and let the ocean waves carry my beat up broken bones. Uh, but it's funny now that I'm skateboarding the concrete skateboard parks and it's so fun to just cruise and float over the hips and catch a little bit of air and move around. It's just really exhilarating and a great thing to do before going into the studio, kind of get the blood pumping. That's amazing because I come from the, I, I used to be a skater. I still skate, but it's amazing to see a, a former skater go achieve so much in the world of art. So that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> well, I would also like to add that when I joined the H. Lewis Gallery in Baltimore, it's because I wanted to curate an exhibition of artwork by professional and amateur skateboarders who were talented artists, but chose to go into the world of skateboarding as opposed to art school. And some of those artists are, you know, making art today on the blue chip scale, like Tony Cox, who shows at Marble Gallery. Um, Brian Anderson, who is about to have a show. He's connected with a curator at MoMA, um, but we've, we've shown artwork by Brad Staba. And so I wanted to show that to my, my peer group. Um, but yes, yeah, skateboarding, I always felt as though it was like an individual sport and activity, making art, you're in the studio you know, by yourself, uh, very, very similar. I think the two uh, balance each other out. Thank you. Guys. All right. I wanted to ask about your technique um, or your approach, more of your approach. It sounds very classical because you speak very um, quite a lot about the underpainting, but then it's you're using these abstract forms and it, I like the push and pull almost the effect of, of, of the flat surfaces on and, and the, 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 illuminate, the illuminated. Um, underpainted so the glow that you speak of and and why exactly did you try to synthesize these two techniques into one and I mean what did you learn from that process um, that's my interest yeah um, in the studio it's it is very much about the give and take I'm sure many of you you know there's some cliches in the studio, right? You're working on a work of art, you love the way it's going, you have a picture in your head, you have an image of where, what you want it to be, and then you start like fighting with the artwork and it just all goes wrong. You never get from point A to point B, like this is not turning out as it is in my head. So it's almost, you know, there's, you know, classically speaking, ways where you have a conversation with the artwork. You know, the artwork says, I want to go in this direction. Sometimes you have to say, let's do that. Let's go in that direction. Let's take a chance, a little bit of risk, play around. So in the studio, I think of two modes of working. I think of creating work. So that's experimenting, being open to new things, discoveries, playing with material. I discovered Art Gara's pigments uh, in graduate school. I was introduced to, the, to those materials. And I just bought some odds and ends. I didn't even know what I was buying. I got like $30, I'm gonna buy a few things, go back to the studio and experiment and play around. And I would discover certain things about the materials. Might not even be exactly what the material was in, intended for, but I would discover things and I would adapt and then bring that into the studio practice. So there's the creative mode. And then when I would get very acute after discovering something, it would go into almost production mode. Now I want to make a body of work. I'm going to pretend to have a solo show coming up. I'm going to make a series of paintings based off of this uh, one particular idea. So even though it's production mode, it's, it's a practice in which I'm still learning how to refine certain aspects. You know, not every work of art turns out a 10. Um, some, some are failures and that's okay. Um, so working in the studio and trying to do something new and then uh, for myself, I would try to refine, you know, I don't believe in perfection. I would just try to refine the process, refine the process. I would think about that Hans Hoffman quote to eliminate the unnecessary so that the necessary can speak. It's a kind of minimalism. 
it's not the minimalism of the West Coast, you know, minimalism, but it's more about like, there's elements in this painting that have nothing to do with what I'm trying to say. I'm gonna take them out. I'm gonna pare it, I'm gonna pare it down. Um, and so it's organic and you kind of just find yourself there. Scott, we have um, a couple of questions now coming up in the chat and I'm just gonna go ahead and, and read the first one to you. Hi, Scott, she writes, suppose you were beginning your career today, where would you go to search for better opportunities in the US or in the world? Do you believe New York is still a place to start and grow as an art professional? I do, I do. Um, although we are in a point of immense change in the world, um, COVID, economic change, I know there, there are many artists uh, leaving New York City because they have the privilege and the ability to leave and go somewhere else. Not everybody has that privilege and ability. Uh, but I still believe that metropolitan areas, in particular New York City, are the best places uh, for the arts. Theater arts, visual arts, all of the arts. If you were to take a poll anywhere you go of, of the population, you know, who likes art? Many people would raise their hand. Who supports art? That's going to shrink. So it's a small percentage of the population that really shows up and supports the art. Buy art, collect art, show up, a small percentage. So if you live in a place with a larger population, you're gonna have a larger audience. You know, New York City has made itself the art market capital of the world for, for we're gonna be close to a century now. You know, so for many, many decades. Um, I don't know if that's going to change and shift. It only became New York City because there was a, a war in Europe. You know, there was a war where artists fled, you know, so everything collapsed. That's the only reason why they left Europe and came to the United States. Question? Really good point. Yes, please uh, go ahead. Uh, hi, Scott. I just want to ask, do you have a moment when you graduate and you didn't find the job in the gallery and you just feel Oh, maybe I choose wrong, or maybe it's not just everything is not working. And how can you just get opportunity to in the gallery? How you just connect to them? And do you think is that um, have the moment that you think it's maybe the artist is not a good job for the for, for the else life, something like that? Yeah, whether you're an artist or an accountant. Um, I think we're all going to have those self doubts uh, in life uh, in every area of life. Um, but going back to fine art and visual art, it really depends on person to person. You know, some of us, once again, have the privilege to make a choice. Do I want to continue this or does my family have resources to help? Um, do artists, some, some artists have immense support and family helping them out and resources. You know, I wasn't one of those people. As I mentioned, my father was a mechanic and my parents never went, went to college and, you know, sort of grew up in a um, lower income house and everything was working hard to get scholarships. And, uh, you know, I had the mentality of, of uh, hard work pays off. And I, I think working smartly working in a smart way and working hard, hard as in always giving yourself time. Artists, beyond working in your studio, you do have to carve out time to do administrative work. So to sit in front of the computer, to do research on galleries and artists, to do research on grant opportunities, artist residencies. If you were to make a list of your top five favorite artists, living and working today, and look at their resumes to see what paths they have taken. You will probably see artist residencies listed, maybe grant opportunities listed. So the light bulb in the head is, I want to look at those artist residencies. You know, I want to research those residencies. I want to talk to my friends, have conversations, talk to your friends about artist residency opportunities somebody might know somebody or you might hear information of well don't apply to that one yet 
there are like stepping stone artist residencies. You might want to go to the Vermont Studio Center, you know, first, and then that might help you be more competitive in your application to go to Yaddo or, or, or McDowell. Um, going to artist residencies, as I said, going from undergrad to grad school, going to art, artist residencies, you're going to meet other artists. Your, your network is going to grow. That's another group who are you know, working hard, doing the work, and making the sacrifices um, to make their art and try to show. And instead of being competitive, you try to help each, each other out. I'm sure Sharon Loudon will talk a lot about this uh, at SVA. Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, one way to think about it is a kind of uh, karmic, um, I don't want to say karmic economy, but a karmic cycle where, you know, the more helpful you are, uh, somehow it just um, ends up coming back around. And do you feel like you're at a disadvantage when it comes to selling or showing your artwork because you live outside of New York City? Uh, yes, Noel, I do. Um, <laughs> so when I, when I left New York, you know, uh, before I left New York, my gallery in Santa Fe, when I was put on these lists of artists to watch in New York City, my gallery in Santa Fe started talking about scheduling my next solo show with, with them. And then I for, informed them, I'm driving across country, I'm going to stop at the gallery. And I sh when I showed up, the gallerist looked at me and said, are you moving? <laughs> are you moving out of Brooklyn? And I, and I knew what he meant. He could no longer say that I'm a young emerging Brooklyn-based artist, which was like a marketing term. Um, so it, you know, it kind of crushed my heart a little bit. That solo show never happened. After a year and a half, they sent my artwork back to me. Although the gallery did go through a transition, they began working more with secondary market um, art from the 60s and 70s and working with uh, an LA and a New York City dealer. And then they themselves moved to New York City. They're, they are in New York City now. Um, and so being in Oregon, it's a new bubble. When I was in New York City, I didn't care what was going on outside of New York, selfishly. I'm glad that I moved out of New York because now I'm aware of what's going on more nationally. But in, or in New York City, painting was always, I don't know, you can almost say king. There were so many commercial galleries in the art market. Painting was always part of the art market. So there was always opportunities for me as a painter. Coming to Oregon, I would say that social practice and social justice is sort of king here. For the galleries in Portland, there's only about five, imagine that, five good galleries. Where in New York City, you have dozens and dozens and dozens. So there's not much happening, there's not much going on. But being here for eight years now, I am seeing a number of exceptional artists in which I get to work with them at the Schneider Museum. There is a number of wonderful granting organizations. So it's a, it's a different arts economy in Oregon. And if I wanted to put the time and effort into it in which I may in the coming uh, year or two, again, looking for a commercial gallery for representation that's closer to me. So San Francisco, Portland or Seattle. When I started this position in 2015, my gallery in New York City in Brooklyn, Janet, Turner, Janet Kernitowski Gallery, sent out an email saying that she was going to close down for one year. She was just married and was going to start a family. And after having her, her son uh, was going to reopen the, the gallery, in which some of her close uh, uh, artist friends in the gallery, some of her girlfriends said, she will never reopen the gallery when she's holding that baby. Um, her husband, uh, they're, they're taken care of. She's probably not going to reopen her gallery and she never did. So that was in, uh, five years ago. Um, so I lost my gallery and in New York City, you know, that was my, my, my group, my friends. And on social media, you would see things going on, exhibitions being 
organized, curated setup, and all these usual suspects getting on the show, and I wasn't getting the call. Nobody wants to pay the money to ship art across the country. That's an expense. Um, so I did, there is a disadvantage, but the advantage is I'm out of the bubble that I was in. I'm seeing sort of a broader art, art world and I'm able to participate in a new dialogue. So we have another question. Um, when did you realize that you had a serious interest in curating? Did you find it difficult to be um, both making paintings for galleries and also curating at the same time? Yeah, running the um, H. Lewis Gallery, you know, I, I did it first off to curate that exhibition of professional and amateur skateboarders. Um, and then I stayed on and realized that I was learning a lot on the job and brought on some other students and artists to take over. Um, going to New York, continuing the independent curatorial practice, just for the sake of getting my friends' artwork out of their studios and out uh, into the light of day. Um, and as I said uh, before, it's a bit of a thankless job. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work planning, organizing, answering questions. And I oftentimes I would say it's like, it's like getting a tattoo. It's a painful process, but once it's healed, you want to do it again. It's almost like an addiction. You know, you're almost, it, it spikes your cortisol. It's a painful process, but then you have the opening reception, you have the party, everybody has a good time, and then you want to do another one. There is an artist uh, in New York, a friend who asked me, aren't you worried of being identified as a curator as opposed to as an artist? And that kind, kind of made me stop in my tracks and I stopped, stopped curating for a period of time. And then interestingly, that same artist started curating and started putting on some panel talks. And so it's good to know that, you know, don't have self-doubt. And a close friend of mine uh, once simply just said, you're good at this, you should keep doing it. Not everybody is good at this. Um, so some of we artists uh, might be able to curate, some might be good writers. As I said, I'm not a good writer, but some of my friends started writing art criticism and getting their art criticism published. So that's another additive, another something to get involved into the art world. Mm -hmm. To organize exhibitions with you and your friends or to write about exhibitions and try to get them published somewhere, anywhere. You know, in New York City, the Brooklyn Rail was a wonderful resource for young arts writers uh, to get their work published, which then led to other uh, resources asking these uh, young writers to to write for them for online blogs and other things. I, I have a question. Please. I'm really fascinated with the overall um, sort of tone of going with the flow that you present, which I admire and it makes your work. The painting um, fascinates me for its counterintuitivity and that you draw it sort of holds you at a distance, but then a uh, closer examination uh, rewards the viewer. And there are things that you hold back and there are things that are revealed in the, the individual relationship with the work. And I'm really fascinated with how you determined that something that looks effortless and like it is easy to do was something that you actually wanted to spend an undue amount, you know, a, a huge amount of time creating. And, and how do you find the audience, or how did you find finding the audience that can appreciate nuance? Mm. Uh, good question. Um, so being a masochist, um, just kidding. Um, so yes, uh, as I started making hard edge geometrical work, uh, minimal work, that is work where any mistake it becomes obvious and apparent. Um, so each, each painting, I try to refine that process and get better and better and better to the point where uh, I might become a bit obsessed with the, with the process and beating myself up over the process. Um, 
those last Chevron paintings I showed, I tried to take a step back in the process in which I did not put uh, for the modular Chevron series, I did not stretch canvas or linen over the panel. I just directly went to the panel, which I think is a risk because if a painting falls off of a wall or hits a corner, the panels are going to chip. You know, so one of the reasons why I, I like using linen and canvas is that it's going to protect the panel. And I am a bit old school with those materials. I like the feeling of the materials. I do, you know, 10, 12 layers of gesso and sanding and wet sanding to get a surface that was the panel to start with. So like, why would I do that? Um, and it, for me, it created a sense of substance and a sense of weight. So in the computer screen, it looks like a flat image. But when you see the painting hanging, hanging in the gallery and you go to the side, like I tape off the edges of the paintings. So when I'm, when I'm done, I remove, all, I remove that. So there's the clean canvas or linen. And then you can see the sense of substance and weight in the layer of, of paint that's on that. I also cross hatch out my brush strokes. So I use large three inch, you know, black bristle gesso brushes to make my painting. And I work flat and I rotate around the table, cross hatching out the brush strokes as the acrylic, the water-based paint begins to dry and it'll lighten up on those brush strokes. And I do sanding in between. So you do have to get close to see that like, oh, this isn't done with spray application. This is created with, with, a, with a paintbrush, you know, by, by hand. Um, so it's, it is a bit of a laborious process. And when I was in New York City, once again, talking about the, the painting scene in New York City, it was very easy to find an audience. And the Janet Kernitowski Gallery, I always equated to a glorified abstract painting club. So at the small gallery in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, we had people like John Yao curating exhibitions. Fong Gui, who runs the Brooklyn Rail, was the editor. He would curate exhibitions. The Brooklyn Pace paint, painter Chris Martin, he would curate exhibitions. Her gallery would be written up in uh, the Brooklyn Rail more often than any other gallery uh, in Brooklyn. So it's like a glorified abstract painting club. And at the opening receptions, you have people there to just talk shop. It wasn't a place to go to, to just go in and buy like in Chelsea. It was like a hangout and a conversation place. You know, that's one of the things I miss the most uh, as well, living here in Oregon and with the gallery being closed, not having that, that monthly go-to um, hang out, deep conversations, and then uh, go out later to continue, continue those conversations. Um, he wonders if your experience working in the museum has affected your art practice. It only affected my uh, preparedness. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about being professional. So from curating exhibitions to uh, working at a museum and uh, here at the Schneider Museum, uh, knowing what kind of communications going to the curator, uh, gallery director, um, you know, what is going to be your, your best uh, chances and communicating and, and getting yourself uh, organized. Um, so that is always kind of refined and polished, that part of the practice. And moving to Oregon, I was very curious to know if my art making practice would change. Leaving New York City, being surrounded by concrete, tall buildings, glass, and now surrounded by mountains, trees, um, would, would I become more open and more expansive? And I haven't, I haven't. It, it's really continued the same. Um, I might think conceptually, I might think more about the bigger picture in the world going on as opposed to art theory talking about my work, uh, and that's about it. Hi, I have a question. Good evening. Um, so I'm curious about your perspective as a curator. Um, you know, I, I do prefer galleries over museum as well, so I don't think that one is more um, prestigious than the other, but when do you notice um, the um, artist's work crossing from 
like having a lot of gallery shows to uh, having a place in the museum's archives. Um, artists uh, can have moments when things can really start to happen for them and there's almost like a snowball effect for those artists. Um, I've In New York and here in Oregon, I've had wonderful opportunities to be on different panels and committees for fel fellowships from state and private um, uh, money giving organizations. And, uh, you know, so even being in a room with other people on these committees and viewing portfolios, um, oftentimes we see an artist work and say, you know, this person's almost there, you know, one, maybe one more year and they can get this fellowship. Uh, and some people, you see their work, you, you see their resumes and, and what the work that they've put in. And you say, you know, this person, you know, they are, they are there. They've, they've, you know, worked up to this point in which uh, we now believe that they you know, deserve this fellowship. Um, and then curatorially speaking, a little bit of that happens as well. You know, an artist whose who studio practice, body of work, um, sh from showing at maybe a not small nonprofit space or a commercial space, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, they're showing the work, they're making good work, they have a vision and a mission uh, to share. And we want to share that vision and mission with our audiences here. Um, you know, we will invite artists. So at the, at the museum, I'm working with from young emerging artists to artists who um, have been established for, for decades. Not one is necessarily better than the other. It's about um, looking for you know, what we want to share with our audiences. And I think commercial galleries, some commercial galleries may work in this way as well. They might see some artists who are having a moment and doing a lot and getting some attention. And that commercial gallery might say, you know, now is the time to you know, do the solo show as opposed to just a group show uh, with the artist. Um, mm -hmm. So I've heard many, many people talk about this as having that moment. And these moments come and go. You know? And so if you feel like you're having a moment, you need to kind of ride that wave and, and try to capitalize on that on that moment, continue making the work. And I've seen artists have commercial success. You know, New York City, Chelsea, first solo show, sold out, big deal. And then all of a sudden they lose control of their studio practice. They're going out too much. They're getting away from what they're doing. And then they're not ready for their next solo show. And I've seen artists have solo shows, sold out, paid off all of their student loans from one exhibition, and then they were really smart. They put the blinders on, went back into the studio, working full time, getting ready for that next solo show, as well as all of the other opportunities, because there will be so many other galleries or curators contacting you, wanting you to participate in other exhibitions nationally or internationally. And if you, are, if you don't have work being produced, there's nothing that's going to be shown, and those opportunities might not come later. Thank you. Scott, we have another question from um, a second year student. Uh, was impressed to hear about your experience running a gallery um, as an undergraduate student in Baltimore. Uh, Mina also went to MICA. Uh, and she recognizes that Baltimore is a really special city because of the characteristics of Baltimore. It's a bit different from bigger cities like New York. She assumes that it would have been um, challenging to run a gallery, uh, and especially in terms of finding collectors, art supporters, and audience. Could you share a little bit your experience um, regarding those challenges? Yeah, we didn't do it for the money. Um, <clears throat> you know, so you know, we had. 10, 10 of us students running the H. Lewis Gallery. Our rent was only $500 a month. We all paid $50 a month. Um, at that time, I wish I could have just spent it on music or other things, but we spent it on the gallery. 
Um, I know after my time, the gallery lasted a number of years until um, local designers approached the, the, the owner of the space and um, opted to pay more money than what the students were paying. And that ended up being the just ultimate demise of the H. Lewis Gallery. But we did it um, for the opportunity to show art, put on opening receptions. We also hosted bands that were, were traveling up and down the East Coast. And some of these bands would say this was the best music playing, playing experience because people would sit down and listen to the music as opposed to bars where maybe people are just drinking and back in the day smoking uh, cigarettes. Um, so there were a number of exceptional musicians that would come through and play. And we would charge you know, $5 at the door and give all of the money to the band. We would do a potluck and feed them and uh, let them crash in our apartments and then they would head off on, on their way. Um, and it was just, you know, you know, Mark said something earlier uh, the other day about cultural producers. So we were just producing something uh, for ourselves, for our fellow students, for our community. Um, some people would come in and buy art, but more, more often than not, they wouldn't. You know, they would come and hang out and that was it. And she wonders if you also uh, plan your time or, or make time for learning new things and absorbing new information? Yes, great question. Um, I do, as, as I said, working in the studio, there is time of cre creating, um, trying to tap into your creativity, um, and then later time for producing. Um, so when I'm in the mode for creating, um, sketchbooks, you know, every day, Everybody should have sketchbooks for drawing, writing, taking notes. Um, so when life is crazy and busy, um, as it is for many of us, especially these days, when I go in the studio, even if my head is spinning, I can open up my sketchbook. So the exhibition I have going up this weekend, the you know short or um, hunting tigers, uh, in a sketchbook. There was a drawing in which I probably drew, you know, eight years ago, ten years ago. It was a little thumbnail drawing um, of of the design that is the painting that's titled after the exhibition. And I remember, you know, the drawing just sort of happened. I was thinking about instead of doing, you know, these sort of like triangle spikes. You know, what if one side was a vertical line and the other side is an angle line? If you put that in a a square format or a rectangle format. And depending on the dimensions of the rectangle, how does this drawing change and, and shift? If it's longer than it is, you know, twice as long as it is wide, so on and so forth. So these are, these are sort of formal elements. And I remember just kind of making a little note of like, you know, sh we're hunting tigers, because it's like, it looks like a tiger. And the title also kind of comes from, you know, childhood and play and using your imagination. So when I opened up the sketchbook, that struck an accord within me of like, oh yeah, there was that drawing that just sort of appeared. Um, I have not made that into a painting. Now I want to make that into a painting. I subsequently made it into a, a few paintings and I'll probably do a few more of different dimensions of, of this design. And when, you, when I'm working in a formal element like this, like coming up with what is the width of this line? Is it an inch, an inch and a half, an inch and a quarter? How does that have an effect on the overall uh, surface? Working in a, in a geometrical way, um, that's when I'm, I'm playing around in a, in a creative way. I know it might seem very analytical, you know, it is. It's almost like a printmaking process. You need to do A before B before C before D. Uh, to set things up, but my, in my head, it's all, you know, coming from my imagination. I'm not a geometrical, you know, mathematical whiz, so I'm trying to use my inventiveness in making these works. Um, so that's when I'm, I'm cr kind of creating work. Um, and then once I feel as though I've come upon something, um, 
I'll start to think about doing the, the series uh, of the work, more production work. And that's the hard work again, you know, so then that's, that's getting into the studio to get the work done. That's making compromises with my, my wife, my partner, and my four-year-old son, you know, Saturday morning, let me get a few hours in the studio, then I'm gonna take him to the park and give you a break. And so, you know, that's, that's life, right? Um, hard work and compromise, but then comes rewards. Scott, thank you so much for being so generous with your time tonight and sharing so much um, practical advice and, and, and wisdom. Um, and I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, the students who asked such terrific questions. Uh, thank you all, Scott. Uh, again, really um, appreciate it, and uh, we will be in touch. Thank you, Mark, and congrats to you, all you students uh, in your second and first year at SVA. You are in good hands with Mark. <laughs> Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Scott.